Ariana Neumann was born and grew up in Venezuela. She has a BA in history and French literature from Tufts University, an MA in Spanish and Latin American literature from New York University, and a PGDIP in psychology of religion from the University of London. She previously was involved in publishing and worked as a foreign correspondent for Venezuela's The Daily Journal, and her writing has appeared in a variety of publications, including the European, the Jewish Book Council, and the New York Times. Um, I, uh, before we begin, I also wanted to introduce myself for anyone who's new to the club. Uh, my name is Michael Simonson, and I'm the Director of Public Outreach at the Leo Beck Institute um, in New York. So I um, also wanted to mention that one reason this book was chosen is because at the moment, the Leo Beck Institute at the Center for Jewish History in Manhattan has an exhibit about um, the history of the Terezin ghetto camp, um, also in German known as Theresienstadt. And um, that ghetto slash camp um, plays an important part in Ariana's book. I also want to say I'm calling it ghetto camp because there's um, always a, a kind of a discussion about Theresienstadt and what it was and uh, if it was a ghetto or if it was a camp. And the uh, Holocaust Museum of Washington has officially now calls it a ghetto camp to, um, I don't want to say avoid, but so, so, so no one is um, bothered or upset by the definition. Uh, so we hope that you come to the Center for Jewish History and see our exhibit about Theresienstadt. There's also a um, virtual version of the exhibit that can be found on our website. And actually, um, Sophie, maybe I'll ask with my assistant, Sophie Rupp, uh, who's here with us and doing all the technical stuff. Uh, maybe um, at some point during the talk, you could put a link to the virtual exhibit. Uh, thank you. So I will now turn it over to Ariana, and Ariana is going to begin with a small presentation about her book. So you can take it away, Ariana. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, thank you for inviting me tonight or today for you guys. I'm, I'm in London, so oops, sorry, it's tonight, and that's not where we should begin. So we're going to go back. Please forgive me. Techni technical, I'm technically challenged. You're um, forgiven. There we go. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm, I'm hugely honored and hugely flattered that you're, you're listening to me tonight. And I'm going to begin with a little summary. I'm going to assume that most of you have read the book because it's a book club. But maybe some of you found it a little boring or a little slow going or you're just, you know, interested in hearing about it before you read it. So for those of you that haven't read it, there's a little summary, or if you read it a while back and you want a little refresher, I'm going to start giving you a little summary. I'm not going to go into all the detail, obviously, because hopefully you have read it or you will read it. Um, but hopefully it'll remind you of what it's, it'll give you a sense of, of what it's about. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about what was important to me in, 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 this, in writing this book, really. So let's start with a little summary, and I'm going to start by doing something a little personal, but then the book is very personal, which is I'm going to start by showing you my baby videos. Because I think it conveys my childhood in a way that that my um, book perhaps doesn't it conveys my childhood in color. So I grew up I was that funny looking child I grew up in a beautiful and vibrant Caracas Venezuela the daughter of a very successful industrialist, a bit of a Renaissance man who was involved in, in business and in industry, in arts in media in government in education. And he was a man that was so engaged, so busy all the time. He was so engaged with his present that it really didn't seem unnatural that, you know, there wasn't very much talk about about the past. Um, he did talk sometimes about having arrived in Venezuela in from Prague in 1949, so I knew that he was had been born in Prague in 1921. But I didn't know much else. I only knew that him and his brother Lothar had arrived in Venezuela in 1949 
escaping communism. And the phrase escaping a broken Europe seems to be lodged in my mind. I'm not quite sure who it was that told me that. But I really had no idea what or whom, if anyone, he had left behind. And my father, I guess, always seemed a little different than other fathers around me. I mean, he was paler than most Venezuelans, um, but he was also older. He was a bit more serious, perhaps a bit more distant um, than other fathers. It's not that he wasn't affectionate because he was really affectionate with me and with my mom, but there were just certain things, certain subjects that he called tonterias. Tonterias means silly things. And that meant a bunch of things were just not talked about, things like feelings or things like family, really. Those all were came under the heading of tonterias. And there was really no mention of his youth in Prague or of his parents, really. And looking back, I realized that I always thought there was something mysterious about him, some intangible secret that he kept locked away. Any questions about his family or his youth in Prague were always either met with silence or he would change the subject. And then there were clues that things were, you know, not quite right. He had worries, of course, he was a businessman, but nothing really that could account for these horrendous nightmares that he would have at night. And he would wake up screaming, he'd wake up the entire house, and he always screamed in either German or in Czech, always, always in a language that I didn't understand. And he was obsessed with order, he was obsessed with punctuality, he collected things like art, and he also had 297 watches. And whenever he wasn't working or he wasn't busy meeting people or writing articles, he would withdraw to this dark room, this very narrow room, which was dark except for the big light that he would use to look at his mechanisms. And he would fit fix, he would sit there for what seemed like hours to me, fixing the mechanism of watches. So that was a bit peculiar, I suppose. And then in a house filled with photos of family, so I, my mother's side is Venezuelan, I don't know if you have a lot of contact with Latin American families, but you know, our family is not just our nuclear family, it's our great aunts and great uncles and cousins 15 times removed. And there were loads and loads of photographs of them, lots of colorful pictures. My mother is really, really beautiful. And there were lots of pictures of her. And juxtaposed with that, there was a tiny picture, just one of my father's family. And it was his grandparents. So I knew they were called Otto and Ella, and it was right by his bedside. And this was the photograph. I think, I don't mean to interrupt. I think you mean to say his parents, your grandparents. Sorry, my grandparents. Sorry, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I have oh, no a... problem. I just wanted not to confuse. Totally fine. I might say something wrong. Sorry. No, Those are my fine. grandparents, Otto and Ella, my father's parents. They were by his bedside in a tiny photograph. And um, I, I'm sure you'll agree it's an odd photograph. If you're only going to keep one photograph, that one has two people. They're not smiling, they're not posing, they're not even looking at the photographer. Um, it's just an odd photograph to keep, but that's the only one that he left. So I think really all of this came to the fore, the nightmares and the photographs and the silences, when as a child detective, aged nine years old, I, a little bit by chance, came across this card. I found a cardboard box and inside it was this card. I can show you the card. I have a box for you guys, I mean, for you guys, but if you guys want to see any of the, of the material, I, I have it here. And some of it is quite interesting to see because it's tiny um, and you can't really see that in the book or in the photographs. But this was my father's ID card. I recognized my father, even though obviously he was much more wrinkled by the time I had come along. He has those eyes, right, that you, I mean, I had no doubt that it was him. But the card was terrifying because it had someone else's name. My father was called Hans Neumann. That said Jan Sebesta. And my father was from Prague. 
and that was from Berlin. So this cardboard box started a personal journey, really, of, of, of a quest, I suppose, for identity to uncover my father's secrets. Um, but it wasn't actually until my father died that I felt I had permission to do that. You see, whilst he was alive, I wasn't allowed to ask questions. Um, so it wasn't until he died and he left me the box, the box again with the same ID card, but also crowned with documents that I finally felt like I could find the answers. So I started this journey and I didn't really fully start the research until 2011 when a box containing dozens of letters from my grandparents in Terezin came my way. And I do urge you to go and see the exhibit. I've, I've gone with Michael and I saw it a couple of weeks ago and it's absolutely, I mean, it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's moving and it has wonderful stories. Um, and it gives you a whole picture of what the ghetto camp of Terezin was like. Um, but so this is one of the letters that I got and they're quite extraordinary because most letters that came out of Terezin had 30 words, they were censored by the Nazis. But my grandparents, when they were in the camp, had contraband snuck into the camp by this very brave woman um, who was married to my uncle, who was a Gentile. And she arranged for things to be brought in and these letters to come out. So I have these incredible letters, as you can see, I don't know if you can see in the image, but they're written on both sides. The papers are crammed with letters. Um, and they're coded because you never knew who would read them, but they're very open letters from my grandparents, Otto and Ella, to their children outside of the camp. And they have detailed conditions of life in the camp, so they were interesting to historians, but more, much more importantly to me, they were filled with their words, with their thoughts, with their feelings, with their anxieties, with the things that they were passionate about. So it was um, a way really for me to get to know my grandparents, to get to know these people that weren't as much forgotten really as, as bailed perhaps in silence. So these are some of the other documents. Um, actually, these particular ones are postcards that came from my cousin Greg, who I traced in California. I didn't know I had a cousin Greg in California. Um, and I've amassed hundreds of documents. I've traveled to France, um, the Czech Republic, to Germany. I've traced people in all those places, people that were related to me or people that helped people that were related to me. Um, I've also, um, and I've traced them in the US, in England, in Indonesia, in Australia. I've done my best to record their memories, to verify the anecdotes, um, and to put together an account um, of my family and of all those people that helped them during the war. Um, and I have gone to all the places that were important to my family. This is me in 2018 and I'm and the color side on much more importantly on the black and white side is my father Hans. Um, he is with his best friend Stenik Tuma in the Tiergarten in Berlin. His picture was taken in 1943. Um, and you might think, hold on a second, this is a family from Prague. What is this guy doing in Berlin in 1943? Which is sort of was my reaction as well when I found the ID card. Um, and you see, my father must would have been, should have been transported um, in May 1942 with my grandmother, but he was taken out with my grandfather because they were essential for the war effort. Then he should have been transported a second time in November 1942 with his father, my grandfather Otto. But he was saved at the very last minute. And here, amongst the things that he left me in the box, is the transport note um, that my father didn't hand in when he boarded the train for Terezin, because of course he was saved. But he kept kept the little scrap of paper, it's absolutely minute, and I can show it to you afterwards if you're interested in it. Um, and then he was called in for a transport a third time, and this was in March 1943, and he was told that no one could save him. So 
he was hidden by a remarkably kind and brave man who ran the family's paint business in Prague, the family's paint factory. Um, he was called Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak hid him in a working paint factory. He built a little secret room and they put my father there. Obviously, it wasn't a very safe place for my father to stay behind. Having absconded from a transport meant that he was wanted by the Gestapo. The family factory was one of the places they would go and look. And luckily for him, they didn't whilst he was hiding there. Um, and then it was actually one evening when he was there in hiding in this tiny room that his best friend Stenik, who's the one in the picture in Berlin, comes in to see him. Now Stenik and him had studied, studied chemistry together, but I think their real bond was over being pranksters, right? They loved to play really silly jokes. Um, and Stenik came in, he was a Gentile, but he had been sent to Berlin as a forced laborer to work in a lacquer factory. And he came in and visited my dad. And by the light of the candle, they just sat there and drank Slivovitz, I presume, um, said to him, you know, we're so overworked, if only you could come and help us in Berlin. And that's really how they concocted this crazy, crazy plan. You see, in Czech, there's a saying, and forgive me, I don't speak Czech, the darkest shadow is just beneath the candle. So if you're going to hide anywhere, you don't hide in the periphery, you don't hide in Prague, where the light is going to give you away. You go to the place where it is the darkest, you go where the shadow is at its darkest. And that is, of course, the center of the candle just underneath the light, the center of it all, that is Berlin. So that's what my father does, um, <laughs> insanely, but he was a prankster. And he goes to the middle of Weissensee to Berlin to a paint factory called Warnecke und Baum. This is a photograph of the entrance of that factory. And he lives there between 1943, May 1943. He takes the midnight train, gets himself a job in this factory and stays there until 19, April 1945 living in this absolutely insane environment. Um, that's a photograph of my father in the official roster of the company um, of Wernicke und Baum. Uh, he was an official employee. He was working on lacquers for the Luftwaffe. He was at the same time trying to pass off some information to some resistance people in Berlin. On his lapel is the pin for the company and he wasn't of course a forced laborer he was a voluntary czech worker which is completely insane so basically when time stop is a is really a bit of a of a story thriller because as i you know you as i piece together my father's life in berlin with the help of some 20 odd pages that he wrote retrospectively about his time in berlin um, I pieced together this completely crazy life, and I'm sure you'll agree with me that Berlin was a pretty unusual and unsafe place for a Jewish boy from Prague to decide to go and hide. And yet, more importantly to me, really, this book is not just about the thrilling life that my father had, the crazy things that he did in Berlin between 1943 and 1945, although those are incredibly important because they show me so much about who he is. Um, but to me, really, the book is much more of a, of a memoir, a testament to, to, to my family, to those, that, to those that were lost, to those that couldn't tell their stories. Um, and I guess it's a detective story as well, because when I was a little girl, I wanted to solve the mystery. So I tell it a little bit, well, like I found it, like a detective st story. Um, and you come along with me as I discover this large, beautiful family. Um, and then here is some of my large, beautiful family. Um, I have to tell you, of course, that this journey of this book didn't start its life as a book. It really, it really was a journey. And I started researching all of this some 10 years before I actually decided it was going to be a book or before I even thought of it as a book. And by the time I got around to the fact that it might be a book, 
um, I was still I was still researching it. So, and the book, I, I mean, I, I had an incredible story where I found an agent very quickly who then sold it to my editor um, very quickly, and then I had a year to write it. So in that year, I had to process all these things that I had found. And I, what I realize now, so many years after I wrote it, is that I hadn't processed a heck of a lot of it. So the book is very raw. The book is very honest. Um, but it was it I was still discovering as I was um, as I was writing it. And I think after when I read it, I think that comes across I, I sort of you know, I reread and I go, oh gosh, I, I mean, that is so naive. I would have written it so differently now. Um, so I, I thought I would tell you a couple of little things quickly um, about about the actual book, things that you won't see, won't hear necessarily about in the book, and that might give you um, a little bit, a little bit more color, I suppose, about it. So the book is actually just a glimpse, right, inside my journey, because what I found out was that I had 34, I mean, my father came from a family of 34 people. And I uncovered so much material, not in, not on all 34, but I have, I mean, I have some incredible stories of at least 20 of them. And of course, I couldn't tell you all the stories in a book because then Scribner would not have published it and you probably wouldn't have read it and I would have lost everybody. People are ready to complain that there were too many characters. So. Um, imagine if I had told the story. So the book is really just a glimpse into this incredible journey that I've been on. Um, and it's again a book about, you know, to me it's a book, book about them, it's about their stories. Um, which then another thing that you won't <laughs> know about in the book is that I always felt very much, and I still do, that this book is about their stories, right? It's about, oh, sorry, I think we're there we go. It's about the stories of my family and all these people that helped my family. And it was never meant to be my story. But when I got an agent and I hadn't written a book before, so I felt very lucky to have an agent at all. She said, you have to put yourself in it. And I said, no, that's really not going to happen because I can't pit myself in the same plane. I have a pretty boring life. I've had a very lucky life and I can't put myself in the same plane as these people who are heroes and who were perished for, you know, for being Jewish. I mean, it's just, I, I just can't. So I said, okay, you know, whatever you think, can we, do you think you can sell the story? And then she sold the story to Scribner. And I figured I would go to Scribner and say, listen, the real story is my father in Berlin and my family trying to stay alive. Um, I'm going to not say anything about me because I don't think my journey is interesting. And the Scribner guy said, there's no, if there's no you, there's no book. So that was really frustrating. Um, but then again, I figured, you know, they know more about books than I do and about selling books than I do. And even though I felt uncomfortable with that, I eventually gave up and figured they knew more about about it than I did. And somehow being in the book or not being in the book became less important. But what remained important about writing the book really is, um, and I'm going to go back to well it, it was telling the stories of these people so i don't know if these are pictures that some one of them is in the book but the others aren't the girl with the puppies is stenka who very bravely um snuck into the camp of theresienstadt and who arranged for the contraband the man with the puffy hair is my dad's best friend stenik tuma um the man with the hat in the middle i don't know if you can see it and the lady who's very elegant those are mr and mrs novak uh, Mr. Novak hid my father. Um, this is a picture that's in the book. It's just my grandparents with my father and Uncle Lotter as boys in the woods near Prague. Um, the picture below is actually my grandmother in the middle, surrounded by all her siblings. And I, I love that photograph. They all look incredibly happy. And I just realized the other day that they all died. Um, they were all killed during the war, either um, mostly in Sobibor, actually. And the little boy in the car on the right 
his uncle, his cousin Jerry. He was my father's youngest cousin, and he was a beautiful poet. And again, I wish I could have told his story. Um, and he also died, but his poems are still there. They, he wrote many of them, and they're still at the Jewish Museum in Theresienstadt. And one of them was published in a book. So it's so it's really about them. And then the other thing that was important to me um, was really time, right? So it was time and timepieces because my father loved watches, and I I I think I love watches too. Maybe not quite as much as he did. But I love them because he loved them and because I think they're beautiful. So what I tried to do with the book is I try to structure it as if it was a timepiece. And I did this as a homage to him because, you know, the book really is just a me reconnecting with him. Um, so I tried to tell the story a bit like this timepiece that you see, right, with, with gems and with dark and intricate things and light and beautiful things and with some wheels and pivots and some wheels that move at different, um, you know, at different paces, right? A bit like a watch that all these things need to function perfectly to tell time. So one wheel is my grandparents story in Theresienstadt. Another wheel is my father trying to survive in Berlin. Another wheel is the people left behind in Prague trying to survive themselves and trying to help them. Um, and that's really what I tried to do with the book. And aside from that, obviously, you know, time was key. I tried to travel through time to recover my family and in retelling their stories, I, I try somehow, and I probably fail, obviously, but I try to give them a little bit of life through remembrance, maybe a little bit more time. Um, and Again, I think uh, going back to that picture of them, you know, to me, these people, Otto and Ella um, and Stenka and Stenek and, and all of my cousins became really vibrant and important people in my life for the past 15 years. So I try, I try to give them a little bit of that life in the book. I try not to talk about how they died, but how they lived. Um, and I think that's mostly it. I, I, you know, I have to tell you that what started as a little girl playing at being a detective has become the most momentous journey of my life. Sorry, I'm a little jet lagged and I get a bit emotional. Um, it's not just because I'm super lucky that the book has sold over 100,000 copies, um, but because I really, it's, it's just been an incredibly beautiful journey for me, an incredibly important journey, because it has brought me closer to these two people that I knew nothing about, to my Otto and my Ella, my grandparents. Um, and I love this picture of them. I don't understand why my father didn't keep this picture instead of that sad picture by his bedside. Um, and, you know, I've acquired a real essence, I think, of who they were, very intimate essence, very different than if I had grown up and sort of, you know, baked cookies and sung with my grandmother in the kitchen, right? or if I had sat on my grandfather's knee and, um, you know, debated Hinduism with him, right? Um, but it's still, and I wish I had had that too, but I've been incredibly lucky to have their thoughts and their feelings and their emotions in those letters. Um, so the journey has given me back these grandparents that I didn't start off by seeking, but that I now realize I missed and, and that I have. And it has also shown me really, I guess, who I am, where I come from. It has shown me uh, my father really, and who a little bit more of who he was. And um, I guess in finding out where I come from, I've realized that it's, you know, it's clearer where I need to go. Please like this video and subscribe for more content from the Leo Beck Institute.